All right. Uh, yes, everyone is always attentive. And, and yeah. mm -hmm. right now we're attentive. Yeah. Now we're attentive. And um, patient is the one that I really want to lean on here. And we will beg much of your patience because we have slides, we have videos, we have a Zoom call, we have mass chaos. So bear with us because like all of us and indeed like the principles of corporate, uh, authentic corporate participation, we are all a work in progress. My name is Dwayne O'Brien. I am the director of open source at Indeed and I'm excited to be a co-panelist with you today. And hi, hello, I'm Alyssa Wright. Um, I help lead the open source program office at Bloomberg. And first time here, really excited to be with you. Right, so who here has heard any talk or read anything about the principles of authentic participation? Okay, just a few people, which is super awesome because it means that the history lesson I'm gonna to try to give around them and, and how they came to be uh, will be meaningful and hopefully uh, meaningful for, for everybody else. So um, slides are very thin in, in this area, but in 20, uh, Twenty, sorry, I have to rewind my everything. In 2020, at the last Sustain event uh, that we had attached to uh, FOSDEM that year, uh, we started on this journey of trying to articulate a set of principles that could be used to help drive accountability for corporate behavior within the broader open source community. And if you imagine on one side of the room, there is a set of conversations that's articulating what bad corporate behavior looks like. On the other side of the room, there is uh, another conversation trying to articulate what good corporate behavior looks like. And we really landed on, on four things at the end of a, of a couple of workshops. The first is that organizations would make public commitments to what they're going to give back to the open source community that had some relation to what they were getting out of the open source community. That there was a TBD transparency goal that was sort of hand wavy. And then we had adheres to the principles of authentic participation. And then we had sort of a basic articulation of those. Um, and then uh, the last one was that there was some public accessible way to contact someone at the organization if the company wasn't behaving according to these principles. Out of that working group, then there's been a, a virtual working group that met over the course of the next several months. Uh, Alyssa and I were parts of that, but it was primarily led by Justin Flory, who took the principles that we had articulated in the room and tried to refine them down and boil them down and, and create a discussion around what those principles could look like. <clears throat> um, and then everything happened since 2020 that's happened, but there was a strong desire coming out of that to, to capture these and articulate these principles in a way that companies, including our own organizations, could make public commitment. And I think of this as the, the inverse of a code of conduct. A code of conduct describes how you're expected to behave in a project. We want the principles, of our, of ten, the principles of authentic participation to be a document that your organization can commit to to say, this is how everyone from our side is going to behave in the open source community, regardless of project, regardless of, of, of who they are and where they are. Um, and so we've been working uh, over the last several months to work to refine these within the to-do group uh, with the intent of creating a, a, a guide that people can use both to, to form their public commitment, but also a basis for internal documentation. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alyssa, who's going to kind of review the principles and talk about them a little more in depth. And, and one other, I suppose, addendum uh, to, to the history lesson. Um, I think in the initial uh, sustained um, working group event, it was a lot about corporations, but the um, regular virtual working group had a much larger kind of like um, umbrella of what it means for organizations to participate in open source. And so, you know, J Justin Flory wasn't necessarily coming from a corporation. He was um, speaking um, both as a uh, as a university uh, member and a uh, and working at UNICEF, and so, you know, we, we are um, uh, Dwayne and myself, we, we, and Yosef, who you meet um, a little bit. We're coming from the corporate like um, entities, um, and our sort of responsibilities, um, as we see it, in participating in open source communities, um, but this is hopefully a first step towards how other organizations um, may see like their kind of roles, maybe their uh, 
quite the same. Um, maybe there are things that are d distinct, but we hope that um, this is uh, not something that's driven um, solely by a corporate you know, engagement, but really um, a much like broader engagement about how organizations um, uh, participate in open source um, communities. So with that, um, the principles that sort of like surfaced um, in the discussions from the sustain um, uh, initial meeting, and again, this is, when we say 2020, we mean really like January 2nd, 2020. You know, it's like really a million years ago. Um, and uh, six principles kind of emerged that are documented um, in uh, a read the docs uh, link that we'll share with you later. Um, and these include um, start early, um, don't just like show up, um, have your answer and you know, check out. Um, really recognize that the community um, is paramount, paramount um, and that you know, your uh, involvement, um, your company's involvement like in open source means that you are now the community. Um, to listen to the community, to listen to the timeline of the community, um, and then uh, to listen again. Um, transparent motivations. Um, this uh, is, has a whole bunch of different complications. We were just talking about it the other day, about like transparency um, about what you want to do, also where you come from, um, how are you transparent when there are maybe um, other um, competitors in the room, and so learning like I think the nuances of like um, being open and honest and transparent, and what might um, always uh, not always be a um, um, a, a simple um, uh, design is um, I think part of like one would say even the fun of participating in open source. Um, another one that's key that we see is as uh, enforcing respect at all levels. Um, and to really adhere to a community established codes of conduct. And then to end gracefully. Um, I like this one a lot, in part because I never really thought about it, but it is so significant. Like, you don't just come in, do something, and then mic drop, I mean, unless, unless that's your style, I suppose. But, um, but you know, you're, the one is looking, it, Participation means like building trust over over time, um, and ending gracefully um, is like a very significant way that um, we have like kind of grounded these principles. I suppose um, uh, ending gracefully is a is an important part to like rounding out what, what we see as as authentic like participation. So. That's like kind of the arc of these six principles that we see um, around what it means for organizations and specifically here companies to participate in open source um, communities in respectful, transparent, um, community driven ways. Um, and so we put together a GitHub repo. Oh. Be before, we, before we go further into that, if, if you if you think about the, the conversation that was happening in the room and sort of how we got to here, um, we began by asking people to sort of inventory bad behaviors that you've seen from, from organizations in the past, right? If you've ever seen bad behavior. Yeah. Um, so, so showing up with a fully formed feature in the, in the community's never heard of you, right? Um, clearly putting your company's interests in front of the community's interests. Um, uh, showing up without listening to people who are already in the community uh, and, and, and not taking their feedback and integrating it. Um, putting a lot of pressure behind a feature that maybe you need for your product, but not communicating the need to the community. So it creates this tension between maintainers who don't understand the urgency of what you're trying to land. Um, and for, you know, agreeing to adhere to the code of conduct publicly as a company. And then ending gracefully, like there are, are a few well-traveled stories of large tech organizations who had you know, 10, 20, 30 developers on a project who one day decide they're just not going to do it anymore. And the impact that has on a project is so significant that we really wanted to communicate you should terminate those kinds of engagements with some grace and give some ramp time and some communication to the project. So that's sort of how the, the conversations from the bad behaviors to the good behaviors to the principles that we'd hoped uh, would help enforce them. 
Um, we didn't include this one principle, I don't know if you recall, which was uh, don't be a jerk. We have to figure out how to do that. This may be in the epilogue or pending. I don't know. But it's uh, you know, a ki kind, kindness, space, I don't know. Um, perhaps this fits under respect, but like uh, you know, all of these are also under the umbrella of like we we look towards um, supporting one another to be like our best um, in these collaborative spaces as well. Ready? Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. So we have a, a couple of resources here. Uh, one is a GitHub, where we've kind of been like, the, how we've designed like building this um, uh, um, guide. And it's not going to be a book. Um, it is a short guide that is an externally facing document to be used for um, both for uh, people to um, stand behind as well as use it for internally for their own um, designs. Uh, you can find that on the GitHub that um, we've at least shortened here. Um, please join us. We're really interested in like a whole bunch of different stories and if um, those principles like kind of uh, like follow what you've seen. Um, uh, number two here is who are we? You, you see uh, myself, uh, Alyssa, and this is Dwayne. Um, Yosef Pratt has been like another um, uh, who you hear from in a, se in a second. He's also um, been a major driver of this um, from the to-do group and is an OSPO um, at a company based in, I don't know if it's based in, but I know he is based in um, Germany. And then Deb Nicholson um, and Richard Litauer, we thought it was really important that it's not just a bunch of OSPOs like sitting around and then, you know, cheering with whiskey or something. Um, we think it's really important that from the very beginning, as we start early, um, that we include um, a, a, a breadth of, of perspective. And so Deb Nicholson, um, coming from the Python Software Foundation and, you know, and her many other roles and hats, as well as R Richard Litauer, who um, is a major um, organizer in the Open Source Summit um, as currently um, part of Open Source Collective um, and is connected with a lot of maintainer communities. Um, we, we are looking for their voices um, in, this, in the development of this guide as well. And you can, if you want to read more, um, you know, there's lots of things that you also find on the GitHub repo, but um, the first link that you'll see there is the original documentation um, from the, um, the summit. Um, guidelines as well as a full summit report um, underneath. And the, um, that, that top link underneath read more, the authentic participation, read the docs, was the, the output of the working group that Justin Flory uh, was leading. Um, and it captures a clean articulation of, of the principles and maybe a sentence or so, but it doesn't have much narrative to it or explain the thinking behind it. Um, the guide that we're working on for the to-do group is intended to do just that. And with the best of intentions, we submitted this panel saying, this is going to force us to have it done by, we, by the time we get to June. And that just didn't happen. We're about halfway through, I think, but there's plenty of opportunity for people to come in and help us form the language around the principles as we put it together. Um, the uh, bit.ly link goes directly to the GitHub project where we're having those discussions. It's unfortunately about this long, so we didn't want to try yeah. to cram it into the, into the slide there. And I'm convinced like one weekend sprint, we would be done. We've been convinced of that for several but months. But <laughs> each weekend something <laughs> happens. Yeah. So and that will be my understatement of the year. Yeah. Um, okay. Are you ready? Mm. Oh, is there a question yeah. on hand? It's under the to-do GitHub. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, the, the question was, is, is the working project under Sustain or the to-do group? Uh, the working project is under the to-do group. Um, are we ready for videos? Yeah. Or any other questions, really quick questions before you meet our other guests? OK. Right. They are waiting at the bit. Cool. They so, are here live. Yeah, so here, here's the way this, this will work. We have uh, video introductions from our three guests who aren't in the room. Uh, and we'll go through and play those, and then we're going to bring them into the Zoom, and we'll step out in the front here and just sort of cross our fingers and hope everything goes well. What about the dancing? But oh, if it okay, doesn't, I might have to, yeah. All right, so with Karaoke? that. Karaoke? 
Uh, feel free. All right. I'm Nicholson. I'm the executive director at the Python Software Foundation, and I just want to say thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be having this conversation about authentic participation in open source. Uh, it's something that I've given a lot of thought to uh, over the years and had some, even some sessions uh, discussing this topic on how companies and communities can get along better and understand each other better and kind of uh, really get each other's motivations a little bit better. I was really gratified to see the six principles for authentic participation in open source and look forward to seeing those fleshed out and normalized across the uh, field. So um, I think it's, it's important to also say that we've come a long way. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of companies employ core developers on key projects, and that's really great. They give them time within their work week to uh, participate in meetings, have conversations, do leadership development in the open source communities that they're part of, and uh, that's extremely valuable. My challenge to those of you in the room is to figure out how we can do that for newer folks. I get why you wanna hire someone who's already a core developer, but I'm looking at where is the next generation of core developers coming from? Where are tomorrow's leaders in open source coming from? And I hope that companies and communities can work together to support people on their journey to expand kind of who we think of as a potential core developer. Right now, we have a little bit of a problem with diversity in open source still, despite lots of energy and lots of great initiatives, uh, we still have a long way to go. And uh, one of the best ways that we can make the pool of folks that can participate in open source like as core developers is by creating jobs that uh, do that pathway so that uh, someone who's newer uh, can be supported along to becoming a person who does uh, participate in meetings, uh, does, uh, you know, spend a lot of their time during their work day talking with other open source community members. So I hope that we can get there. I hope that you will uh, be part of that uh, work to even things out and make open source stronger and more diverse. I'll be in the chat and um, I'll look forward to hearing from you. Hi, I'm Joseph Pratt and I work at Ivan and I'm the manager of the open source program office over there. As you can see, I'm a recording and you might be wondering why somebody from Europe who hasn't ever met Alisa, Dwayne, Richard, or Deb is even involved in all of this? So the answer is pretty simple. Uh, I believe that companies need to up their involvement in open source projects, but we need to do these in a sustainable way. So at Ivan, for example, we contribute to several third party open source projects. And it's really clear to us that these kind of guidelines are totally necessary. This also means another thing that either I was meant to be writing a guide like these alone, or I could join some brilliant minds doing it. And obviously the choice was made. I joined the brilliant minds. Also another thing is that Alisa's enthusiasm is contagious. And actually when she shared with me, these are the principles of authentic participation. You want to create a guide around them. I said, wait a minute who is reading my mind right now. So it was completely obvious to me that I needed to join this and be involved in this project. And having a guide like this one, I think it's necessary for two main reasons. So the first one, I think it's really needed because we, help, we need to help create a frame where a trustworthy relationship between projects and corporations can arise. And if these two parties can work together effectively, we can achieve wonderful things. The open source projects will benefit from lots of dedicated developers and companies will see the projects they rely on well supported and maintained. And the second one is for the employees to understand how to navigate the conflicts that arise when we put the open source projects and the community needs together. Because let's be frank, there's two 
do not always match. And sometimes the alignment is really complicated. So having a common understanding on how to resolve those conflicts is needed. And I can see the work that we started with these as something much, much, much bigger. So project governance is now helped by the code of conduct on the project. So every single project around has a code of conduct that helps build the communities around. So this guide is the dual of these. It's a contract on how the company's employees will behave and actually also the promise of the company to keep this true. And I believe that's worth aspiring to. Hello, my name's Richard Litauer. I wear a lot of different hats. Um, been helping out the past few years with Sustain mainly, working on building a better sustainable open source ecosystem. And now I work with the Open Source Collective on the 4,000 projects that use Open Collective as their physical host, which are open source projects, and also digitalinfrastructure.fund. I've also been running a consultancy for the past six years or so, helping companies figure out how to basically have an OSPO. Didn't call it that, but that's what I was doing. So I've seen a lot of inauthentic behaviors. So I think that this movement towards having an authentic guide to how to help corporations work with open source projects is incredibly timely and useful. Um, corporate involvement in open source isn't going anywhere. Uh, so it's really helpful to be able to sort of have a way of saying which corporations are going to try and give back and which ones aren't, that helps reduce FUD uh, on behalf of the maintainers who work on those projects, which is so useful for the projects and the ecosystem at large, because then that means they can work on longer term, say roadmaps, or don't have to worry about uh, scuppering projects or projects being abandoned later. They could have some idea of like, here's what's going on. This corporation is investing this much here. Um, helps with diversity. Um, in the sense that they now have time to do that sort of things, helps with more sustainable practices, like giving back to dependencies in the long run. If you know what your budget is for the next year or something, or you know how a corporation is going to involve, you're more likely to be able to say, okay, what can we do to make this project more sustainable in the long run? How can we shore up the dependencies that we also depend on? So that's super cool. Um, another good thing about having some sort of, say, contributor covenant-esque covenant between corporate stakeholders and open source is that it gives projects a way of naming, shaming, and more importantly, praising corporate investment or corporate, you know, uh, cooperation in open source. Right now, there's just a lot of, okay, every corporation is going to be interacting in some way or, or other. And you sort of have to go off of, well, we're going to hope they don't do X, you know, by having at least something there that says, no, we're signing up for X and saying, oh yeah, they've honored their agreements over the last year or five years. Super useful for projects because then it just allows them to have that security and work from a place where they know what's going on. Obviously not all open source projects need that. Um, a lot of them are just fine on their own. A lot of them are fine with having corporate sponsors dip in and out of their roadmaps or their projects. But for those projects which are good at boundary setting, which know how to interact with corporations or are able to use this to learn how to interact, um, this sort of movement is just really exemplary of how the open source ecosystem is maturing as a whole. Maturity comes with all sorts of benefits. Um, so I think it's great. Uh, I'm really excited to see this work move forward, especially as it came out of sustain. So that is awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm Richard Littauer. I approve of this message. So thank you. Apologies. I wish I could be there in person. Um, hope you're all having a great time. Thanks. Bye. All right. And, and now we get to the potential for breaking the internet. Um, as I'm going to turn, I'm going to like physically pick this up and turn it around and hopefully give um, our remote participants a view of the audience while Alyssa and I come and sit up in the front here. Hey, look at that. There's a lot of people in this room, y'all. 
Hello. <laughs> and they can Hi. be heard. All right. Panelists, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Wow. I don't want to jinx it, but that went so much easier than I thought. Okay, take the insects. No, no, I like the. Oh, okay. I like lefty. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of material, um, material kind of all over the place. There's, there should be ample room for people uh, to ask questions here at the end. No. We'll need to repeat them for the panelists. Are you okay? You're not, you're not going to show up on camera. We're just trying okay. to stay out of their way. Um, the, the, the questions. Yeah, yeah. I've got the questions. Them? All right, good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Way prepared. Um, I, I will. I will throw this one out to our remote panelists or to Alyssa as well. Why should companies adopt these principles in the first place? Well, why are you not answering it? Because I asked the question. <laughs> I, I, I think it's I good think to give people a sense of what your intention is going to be, um, and if. You want a shorthand to do that without uh, trying to craft your own, like, I wonder what they want to hear or what we should be doing. Um, then it's, it's nice to go with a new quantity. Yeah, I, I guess the answer I would give here is, is that when, when we talk about holding companies accountable, the next question you have to ask is accountable for what? And if you don't have a what, you don't really have a place to start. Uh, and so um, the idea of, of getting companies to commit to a, a public set of principles that they're adhered to, I think serves as the starting place for, for accountability. For it me, also I'm helps us iterate. Um, no. Without having a clear foundation, it's much harder to improve. Mm -hmm. And so by having people work together on the same thing, it'll help us be able to figure out what works and what doesn't, what authentic participation looks like and what it doesn't look like in a way that's much more managed and approachable and easily, or easier sign onable by other companies in the future. What were you gonna say, Alyssa? I was gonna say that I think there's um, this combination of a, a lot of freedom that um, having certain principles affords uh, one in, to know how to participate. Like, okay, I know I, I'm expected to be transparent about my motivations, you know, and I, I, I can come with that, um, with that in mind in my, you know, conversations um, and, you know, actual, you know, code contributions and, and review. And so I, I feel like um, it's, uh, it may not be perfect and it re requ will require like iterations, but I think it provide some guidelines as opposed to having a, um, a black box for a lot of people where, you know, contributing to an open source ecosystem is a much, uh, can be a very vague space and, and very foreign to the organization that they spend their day to day in typically. So. Actually, the transparent motivations, Joseph, I'd like to throw over to you because there's this inherent tension, both in transparent motivations and in, in putting the community needs in front of the company needs, especially when you're representing a, uh, a corporate OSPO, how do you think about that tension yourself for Ivan? Yeah, yeah so uh, that's one thing that we, we usually put the community first. So one of the things that we, that we discuss as well and we, how we decided how we want to approach our uh, contributions to open source was not from the lenses of the company, but from the lenses of the community. We want, we want to be part, to be part of the part community, community show, so, so we should behave as part of the community. Of course, of course um, the company might have some requirements or feature requests, and then we need to make sure how those ones play together with the current requirements of the projects, the current region, and, 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 and like where, where the projects want to go. And when those things match, then it's, then it's a match made in heaven, then we can just go for it. But when it's when we need to tweak something that's clear we need to be tweaking our internal needs the community needs of course that will make raise some questions for the company saying why then i should do this thing i just want this feature but again that's not a sustainable way of contributing to open source projects and one thing that we might see from different or coming from the company as well from organizations and corporations is that 
suddenly the people who want to put work in open source might not be listened to that much because we don't have again transparent motivations people will think ah yeah do you do this thing because you want to do something else or what's behind it so by by going front and clear and being transparent i think we'll have both both parts and again improving the project improves the company needs as well so and does an addendum on that too like and it's it's interesting to use the word transparency because it's both transparency about like uh, one's goals um, while working within an open source like um, environment, but I think also um, and vice versa, it's important to have transparency about um, as a corporate employee transparency back into the company about what you're um, what what you're doing there. Do you know like I mean that you're you're not just uh, plopping in like a new feature request because that's just not the way things move. So, but you might be building trust, like you might be learning, you might be um, uh, building leadership, like and voice. I mean, so there's there's lots of different ways that like transparency can can flow, and it's not just a, a one way from like company to an open source project. I think. Um, you know, it must circle back into um, a company like understanding of how open source like works as well. I just realized that our, our three remote panelists here, Alyssa and myself, as disembodied voices in a room oh, that yeah. you can't see us. We're, so we're looking up at you we're every time we're talking. Yeah, we're yeah. a podcast. Um, I, I think there's 10 minutes left in the time slot, and I have ample really? other questions, but I want to throw out for questions out in the audience, and I see a hand there. Uh, I'll, repeat the, repeat, I'll repeat the yeah. question. I like the model here for corporate governance and, and obligation into the community uh, and protecting from bad actors, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering about how corporations get a guarantee that community bad actors won't, like, for political motivations or other things, suddenly blackball them from, even if they're adhering to all of these, these guidelines, which I think are awesome. How, what kind of protection do the corporate um, participants get? So the, 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 the question for people on the stream and also for, for uh, our, our remote panelists, um, they, they like the model that we're assuring some good behavior on behalf of corporations in the open source community. Um, how do we ensure protections that uh, corporations won't get blackballed out of the community by malicious actors within the community itself? and wonder what the panel has to say. I think you had a, a question or comment there. Well, I don't have an answer to this, but I, I feel like you're like right at the juxtaposition of a really good like next stage for this um, in, entire uh, dialogue. It's like, what does, what, I, I just like the, the word enforcement, so I'm gonna like consciously stay away from that. But like, you know, we have these principles, like how do we, stand for these principles, you know, and um, and I think that um, ourselves, who uh, companies that like are committed to 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 um, being these, you know, six uh, these six things in open source communities, um, need to have a conversation about like what does it mean when maybe one of us are not, and I think in complementary. Like, what does it mean when you know we see uh, when we see things that make it really difficult for an, a, a, comp a company uh, contributor to participate in open source community? Um, I, I do think there's a, like more of a history of of you know of codes of conduct, you know, and um, with, and you know governance models in open source communities that we can like rely on on the open source side. But I still think that there's a um, a conversation that's like just at the precipice that we, we need to have to have this not done because I think we can make move forward with this uh, very far but I think for it this to continue to evolve I see I see comments from Richard and from Deb as well go ahead Richard yeah no, I was um, uh, uh, frankly gonna say, gonna say it doesn't, it doesn't offer, offer protection, protection that way, that way. Um, um, Companies are already exposed to that sort of issue all the time. What this does is it gives you a really good um, framework to say, no, we've acted authentically. We Here's what we said we would do, and this is what we're doing. 
and your and malicious your actor go away, away. Which, is which is better, better than what we have, have right now, where you have to sort of explain that longhand every, every time for every single company. company. The other thing that's um, different about this is that corporations are not people. And whatever it says in the United said, um, corporations have undue power in open source because they have, say, money that a lot of open source maintainers don't have. And so it's important for them to, in some sense, have more accountability than, say, malicious actors in the community who can always just join, run into the room, yell a lot of stuff and leave. Um, we have other ways of, of making that, of making those communities better, like codes of conduct. What this does is it helps out the long term health of the projects. And, and that, that in turn, turn helps the corporations because um, they, they want they stable want projects, projects as, well. as well. So I would, so say, I would it say it doesn't necessarily harden that vector, vector but it does at least make it a bit less watery. I don't know. I'll work on that metaphor. Deb? I was going to add to that that um, I, I kind of on my other thing of like, if you're hiring developers and you're going to be using open source, uh, that it's not enough. I mean, it kind of never was to just have people who could code. Uh, you need people who can collaborate and communicate their work goals and uh, communicate what their timeline is to their coworkers, whether they're community coworkers or in house coworkers. Uh, you just like, I think companies just have to really own that, that they are not you know, you know hiring, hiring machines, machines that write code. code they're hiring, hiring human beings that can function in the ecosystem and accomplish goals communicate goals and then set new ones based on what happened the last time so uh yeah it, and if and if people can't do that and it's part of the job then maybe they aren't a good fit to be employed by you anymore so a flurry of hands for other questions as soon as i asked for them so. <laughs> Uh, Vincent, Vin Vinit, sorry. Thank you. Um, my question was about one of your six points of guidelines. Uh, the last one was called and gracefully. Mm -hmm. So the question is like, do you have a positive model of, or do you have a model of what end, ending gracefully looks like? Mm -hmm. uh, the flip side of that question is, do you anticipate points of friction between the community and corporations, wherein uh, funding dries up or mm -hmm. Directions change, or people realize that they don't even need that product anymore, mm -hmm. uh, or the maintainers don't want to work on that. Anymore. Sure. So, um, Vinit's question for the panelists and for the stream is that. Uh, he appreciates the ends gracefully uh, principle, and do we have models that we can lean on or, or demonstrate uh, positive examples for what that looks like? And do we anticipate friction between the community and, and the company uh, as, as part of that process? And I have a, a off the cuff answer and then I'll throw it off to the panelists. Absolutely friction, it would be anticipated. Um, I think it's the not goal- open source <laughs> if it's not friction. But, but, I, but I think the goal is to not experience that friction suddenly, right? Um, and I think if we're gonna look for a model, um, the, the model that we already use for communicating the end of life of a piece of software is a fine model for how we should communicate end of life for our involvement in a piece of software, right? So, um, knowing, you know, giving the project however many months you're going to give, and that's like, there's no one size fits all answer for that. Like if it's a, if it's a 10 file JavaScript module, your commitment is different than if it's a 10 gigabyte, you know, massive application, right? So um, uh, communicating, you know, according to what the project really needs, a, a amount of time for them to make a plan for how, what they're gonna do with the project with this sudden deinvestment of resources, whether it's people or time or hosting services, uh, you suddenly can't host our meetups here anymore, like whatever that is, don't just pull the rug out from under people. Um, Stephen, I see your- And just to quickly add on, I mean, yeah. look at how long it took to eventually sun down, you know, things in the browser community or God save the UNIE, yeah. right? Stephen's Stephen's comment was uh, that uh, if you look at the way we end of life pieces of software like browsers, there tends to be quite a lot of runway, and sometimes we move those if we need to. We don't always have the luxury of doing that when business priorities change. Like you might get a directive, hey, this unit has been reorged, and suddenly these people were somewhere else, right? But the more you can communicate that with the project, I think the better for everybody. Uh, Joseph, I see your hand up there. 
Yeah, I wanted to say, like, uh, I agree completely with what you, with what you said, Dwayne. And but basically, when companies want to enter into open source business, like, I like, will bring people to collaborate on projects. They need to also plan the exit strategy if something happens. So. Uh, Creating a team to work on open source, yeah, it's a costly thing. It, it needs a lot of planning and probably a lot of money as well. But we need to make sure that we, we keep some just in case what, what happens when we need to stop this thing, if we need to stop. So that needs to be kind of planned up front. So what's our exit strategy for these projects? And you know, it doesn't need to be the same one for each of one, but I think when we enter, we need to enter with that thing in mind. How? And if we don't ask this question, we will not have the answer, and then everything will be rushed and hurried. But we ask this thing when we enter. If I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, if I may say two things. One, um, I was part of some of these original discussions like two years ago, you know, in another lifetime, um, and uh, uh, relatively recently new to the ASPO um, at Bloomberg, and something that I found. Um, I found uh, really interesting in this kind of like uh, juxtaposition, though I think I'm going to miss the major point, but one is, is that communities are people, like these projects are people, do you know, and you sort of forget that I think when we, you know, drop things not gracefully, do you know, so um, I feel like the grace is really an acknowledgement that these, uh, that we're, um, we are a community not of like just code exchange, but uh, of people. And so um, for me, it is a reminder um, all the way at the end to, to keep that part a um, prominent in, in, in how we um, end things and to continue to establish and um, keep a priority the, uh, the trust that we have built as a community, um, as people. Um, and the second thing is that I, I feel like, um, again, as I've learned a lot about OSPO communities, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about like how to make everything work, like you know, legally and with security, and like what are the tooling and the system, and and I think uh, Richard was saying like you know we're at a space of maturity to also kind of speak about this in parallel, and I'm glad it's not we're doing this you know. 10 years down the line, like I'm glad we're doing it, you know, now this, I think at the beginning of an industry, but like these are, I feel like the, um, um, and others have used this term before as well, and I hope I'm using it in the same, you know, context, but like the social framework of what it means to be part of um, an open source community and the part of the ASPO space. It's like, this is a lot of the art and nuance of like, how do you, how do you really collaborate like with with people um, is like not so easy. You just don't throw like a bunch of you know developers into a sandbox and be like, you know, fight it out. This. Yeah, <laughs> let's know how it goes. <laughs> just just make sure you sign like the CCLA. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, um, speaking of ending gracefully, which breaks my heart because Julia, I see your your hand like ready to rock it up. Throw it out really quick, and then we'll, um, we'll do our best to wrap up the the, the question the answers at the end. All right, um, my, my challenge for the panelists, and you're gonna, you're gonna love this, because I already got the one minute sign and I know it was two minutes late. Well, um, I didn't see it. I'm, I, I did, I'm gonna repeat <laughs> Julia's question and we each have a sentence to answer the question and I'll do my very best. Julia's question is, given that all projects have their own norms for transparency, how do you honor the transparent motivations principle while honoring the community's principles while also trying to honor your company's principles. Richard, you've got the first answer. One sentence. Principles are more like, more like guidelines. guidelines. <laughs> okay, that's Richard's answer. Um, Deb, how about you? 
Yeah, I think you have to, you, you can offer more than you uh, expect, and that's a great way to build trust as far as transparency. Joseph? I will try to find a common denominator or the intersection between those, and when not, I will try to err on the side of the community and not on the company. Mm -hmm. Alyssa? Uh, I think you have to try find your own inner north and then be transparent with everybody else, the choices that you've made. Um, <laughs> my, my answer, cool. Uh, didn't buy myself nearly enough time to, to, to no, 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 no. I th so um, I, I think at the end of the day, our responsibility as leaders in the open source program offices that we run or advocates for open source and the companies that were advocates is to hold the space and hold that tension between company motivations and community needs. And in my professional opinion, when those are in direct conflict, you have to side with the community. And that's gonna put you in a challenging position with your employer sometimes. But that's the responsibility we took on when we stepped into the role. And that's my answer. So with that, thank you everyone for bearing with the, the panel, the videos. Thank you, remote panelists. Um, this went so much better than I thought it would and from a technology standpoint. And, and thank thanks you. for coming. And thank you especially to the AV folks in the back who found out not too long before our talk that we had videos and a Zoom and slides and we were doing everything. They did a great job, so. Yeah, and please join us, so, you know, on, on the Slack and I yeah. hope that we can continue to have this conversation. So, thank you.